Before I was a priest, I was a professor of philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. And <clears throat> getting a degree in philosophy gives one the, uh, maybe it's the pride, but the, uh, the disposition to basically want to be able to teach anything. <laughs> this kind of confidence that I could teach anything. So I'm happy to delve into aesthetics. <clears throat> and as things would have it, the the last two years, I was working with a friend of mine, Dr. Jones, on a book on beauty. So I wasn't writing the book. We, I was just reading chapters that he produced for the book. I was also suggesting, I was reading with him certain, certain works on aesthetics and trying to just work out a theory of aesthetics and how can we understand art and art history and not just art and art history, but also music, dance, architecture, poetry, literature. I think these principles, they can apply in all these different areas. Once we go through them, I think you'll be able to see this, see how this is, how this is so. So just to, what I'd like to do is first, I'd like to just set out some problems or set out the problem or set out the circumstances. And then after that, I'm gonna give a, a kind of, uh, actually a, crit a critique, a philosophical critique of one way of dealing with the problem. And then what I think is the correct approach. And part of showing the correct approach, how to speak about art, we'll have to go through a little bit of the history of art. We'll look at some paintings. We'll be able to talk about them. And, that's, that's the idea is that uh, <clears throat> we could end up spending all day long talking about the paintings, I think, once we have the vocabulary for it. So first of all, okay, The Dangers of Beauty, that's the name of the lecture, that's the name of the book. And one of the images here, the, the, the image that we're using here is, a, this is a little play on the famous image, a famous painting by Rubens called Noli Me Tangere. Don't touch me, so our Lord and Mary Magdalene after the resurrection. <clears throat> and we say dangers of beauty because on the one hand, well, what's, what's the problem or what's the, what do we, when we're speaking of beauty, we, we don't like to, what, there's a tension. I, I read maybe better than saying there's a danger, there's a tension when you deal with beauty. And well, before we get to that tension, I just wanna, I wanna kind of go through by the way, here's the cover of the book, which is the painting, which is Rubens' painting. Ultimately, right, beauty originates from God himself. And beauty is an important aspect because the social order, whether it's the order within the family or the order within a friendship, within the family, within the ethnic group, within the nation as a whole, within the world as a whole, depends on our capacity to apprehend beauty. Why? Because beauty is, this is a little bit philosophical language, but hopefully we'll get into it. Beauty is transcendental. There's, there's, there's four transcendentals, right? The true, the good, we'll, we'll repeat this again. And by the way, all these notes and all these slides we can make available afterwards. So there's no, there's no uh, patent on this material or trademark. <laughs> so the, the transcendentals, which we'll get back to, are the true, the good, the, the one, and the beautiful, right? These are transcendentals, are qualities that God possesses, and that when he creates, he gives to everything that he creates. We, whatever we create, since we are in the image of God, everything that we create participates because we, one, of the, one of the things that we can do as humans that's a sign that we are made in the image of God is that we too can create. We, are co, we can be co-creators with God. <clears throat> so what's the tension? And, and also maybe as we're saying the tension, I just want to go through some moments where beauty came up in the last two weeks, just in conversations that I had or... or yeah, so for example, after the Easter Vigil at St. Paul, I was at St. Paul's for the Easter Vigil, and we were, I was talking with some of the undergraduates after the Easter Vigil, 
And there was this question of, well, what attracts, what attracted you to the church? And one of the fellows said, well, actually, the first thing that attracted me was the beauty of the mass. It was the, it was one of his friends a few years ago invited him to the Easter vigil. And at St. Paul's, the music is particularly beautiful. The church itself is beautiful. The church itself is a piece of art. And the liturgy is beautiful if it's done properly, if it's done well, if it's done with love. And people notice it, that it strikes them. And so that's what this fellow was saying. The first thing that drew him in was the beautiful mass. And you could say this also, like the mass, ent the mass is an example of how beauty, it enters, through, it enters directly through the eyes, right? It enters directly through the senses. But going back even to St. Augustine, when St. Augustine speaks about music and beauty in general, <clears throat> right, there's this beauty, part of beauty is also, beauty makes us think of love. It doesn't just make us think of love, it can make us experience love. And why is this? So when we, again, in, other, in another moment, we could go through the different forms of love just very brief, we'll just go, through, we'll just put out three here. Agape is sacrificial love. Philios is lo the loyal, affectionate, intimate love between two friends. And Eros is, <clears throat> Eros is wonder er, er, so one of the ways of understanding eros is that it's sometimes people will just reduce eros to pleasure of some sort but eros is much more than that that one part of eros is that when you see something beautiful it causes you to wonder and you want to always have it <laughs> right when you look at you know when, just as a simple example when when you see a beautiful sunset it, the thought could come to your mind, wow, this, this is, you know, this is God's creation. Or it could also, like, I wish I could always have this. Or I wish I could have this every day, right? That's, that's the wonder in the face of the beautiful, which is eros. Or when someone looks up at the stars and it, it, it amazes them. <clears throat> and it leads them to wonder, but also to be in awe as they wonder. Right, so we can also... This also presents the tension that can be involved in beauty, right? Because something that's beautiful, it can, it can, it leads to our, it leads our desires to start to express themselves. And if our desires express themselves and gets out in a way out of control, well, then that leads to ugliness. It leads to sin, right? It leads to a lack of harmony or disorder. So. We're, we're kind of starting to enter just from a from a, a a personal standpoint there can be this this aspect this tension in beauty another little another little uh what i like to call now anic data right as opposed to anecdotes and these are anic data points right for those who are more scientifically minded another anic data point <laughs> is also after this mass at the easter vigil i ran into this physics professor this astrophysics professor at harvard and she said, she said, it's really interesting. I, I came here, whatever it was, eight years ago. I forget the number of years ago. She herself is a convert. And she said, I came here eight years ago. And eight years ago, it was just a quarter of the church was full. But this year, the entire church was full. And it's every year the mass gets more beautiful. And then the next year, more people come, right? right? So, so beauty also has this little attractive power. And then her husband then said to me, uh, in the same conversation, you know, I too, there was also too a time in my life when I wasn't Catholic. And one of my difficulties was that I, I came to the point where I realized I, what I was thinking was, this is all too beautiful to be true, right? It's almost like it's just too beautiful to be true. And eventually he, he came to realize that it's, it's not too beautiful to be true. It's beautiful and it's true, right? Now, anything that's good can obviously be corrupted, right? That part of the human condition is that almost every, almost anything you can deal with in life, there's going to be a way in which it can be done well 
or created well or used well or used properly. And there could be a way it could be corrupted. And that's part of the challenge, you might say, or the tension involved in dealing with beauty. But it's not just, it's not just dealing with beauty. It could also be knowledge or technology or justice or morality, right? There's, or the human virtues even, right? Anything, so we, don't, we want to avoid the approach of saying, well, something is just, cat we'll get to this when we talk about iconoclasm, right? Any, something is like categorically bad or evil. Right? But we also don't want to be naive and say, well, there's no problem in, in dealing with X, Y, or Z, whatever X, Y, or Z ends up being. <clears throat> so every good thing can be used. This is part of the tension or the danger when we discuss beauty. Why? Because everything that's good, it can be corrupted. It can be used to enslave souls. Or as Nietzsche says, <clears throat> Nietzsche, Nietzsche in the 19th century, he saw that art, dance, painting, literature, that all of these things were inspired by, as, as, at his point in Germany, he understood that the foundation of the social order was based on a culture that was inspired by Jesus Christ and Socrates, right? And Nietzsche says, so he took Jesus Christ and Socrates to be his two great enemies. Why? Socrates, because Socrates convinced us that there's a truth about nature that we can come to understand. <clears throat> and we may not grasp it fully, but we can at least grasp part of it. And Jesus Christ taught us <clears throat> that the model of love, the model of friendship and the model of love is the love that man can have towards the celestial virgin, meaning the Blessed Virgin Mary. And Nietzsche said, <clears throat> I want to, if, if, if I'm successful, what I want to do is I want to replace that ideal of love for the celestial virgin as the model of love. And I want to replace it with the war between the sexes or the battle between the sexes. And Nietzsche thought that one of the, like, for example, he even gave an example of a play from ancient Greeks, Greece that he thought would typify what his goal was. And the play that he pointed to was the Bacchae of Euripides. <clears throat> when I was, uh, it was this, this time of year when I was a professor at Notre Dame, I was giving a lecture on Nietzsche and so we went out. One thing you can do this time of year at Notre Dame is you can go outside for class. Everybody likes going outside for class. And so we went out to this lake, the lake, and there were some picnic tables at the lake. So the whole class can sit using the picnic tables. But the lake and these picnic tables, they're right across the road from the grotto at Notre Dame, where it's a, you know, the grotto of Lords. So there's an image of Our Lady of Lords in the grotto. And as I was giving, it was kind of fortuitous as I was literally saying these words. So I was, I was, I was at the lake behind me was the, behind the students was the grotto. And then behind me was the lake. And as I was saying these words, I could point to the grotto, right? There's the celestial virgin. <clears throat> and then, well, actually part of the Nietzsche quote also is the model, the, the new model of friendship, Nietzsche says, is going to be the savagery that animals show to each other, right? And right as I said that in the lake behind me, uh, this one duck started to try to drown the other duck. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't use any neural links. I didn't have any control of their minds or anything, but it was the perfect thing. It was actually the perfect thing. Everyone was, everyone was amazed. They thought that I couldn't have paid them, right? I couldn't have paid them to do that either. either. Right? <clears throat> so, Nietzsche proposes the Bacchae, and of course, in the Bacchae, in the Bacchae, this is the this is the uh, the play where the women of the city they go up into the mountains in order to engage in pagan sacrifice, ultimately. And the tragedy of the play is that while they're wrapped up in this, uh, not just kind of the ero the eros of wonder, but while they're wrapped up in this erotic frenzy, 
they become blind to what they're doing. And so what ends up happening in the Bacchae, this is spoiler alert, so, but what happens in the Bacchae is that Agave, the mother, ends up killing her son. Basically, they tear, tears his head off. And then the, at the end of the play, she, one of the characters basically starts to get her to use her reason again. So she kind of wakes up from her frenzy. And then she looks down and she sees what she's done. Right? So that's, that's part of the... But so when I was at Columbia in the 1990s, <clears throat> there was like a big movement to start performing the Bacchae everywhere. Like, I don't know, the Bacchae. But what they would do, it was very interesting, right? Because what they would do is they would cut off the ending, right? They would, they would, they would perform the Bacchae. This was New York City in the 90s. And they were all Nietzscheans, right? So they would, they would, uh, they would show the Bacchae, but then they would cut off the last scene where Agave wakes up and sees what she's done. So, <clears throat> by the way, there's a movie that kind of portrays the, uh, the religious values uh, behind the Bacchae. It's one of these, it's a B movie, right? It's, it's a Nicolas Cage movie. It's called uh, The Wicker Man, right? The Wicker Man. And uh, if ever you want to understand a little bit, what are the kind of, what are the religious ideals that Nietzsche had in mind? They're, they are portrayed in Nicolas Cage's The Wicker Man. There's other versions of that film, but I, I don't recommend them. I mean, they, they, tell, they tell the same story, but in, anyway. <clears throat> so what's the thesis I want to propose? The thesis that I want to propose is that without some connection to nature or reality, and we'll explain what, what the part of the thesis is saying, well, what is that connection to nature and reality we're trying to come up with? Art, <clears throat> at best, becomes a form of insider trading, which is, or, or the opinion of the powerful, or the opinion of the rich and the powerful. At its worst, it becomes a mechanism of enslavement and control. <clears throat> so that's why, that's why looking at Augustine here, right? How we, what art is, how we view it, how we create it, it does have this impact on our souls, and on the social order. And ultimately art should lead us towards God. It should ultimately lead us towards transcendental being to use words, if, if some, even if someone doesn't believe in God, we can still kind of say, well, art should lead us towards something that's transcendental, something that's greater than ourselves. If not, it'll become a form of enslavement or control. <clears throat> And so as I was preparing this, this talk this week, uh, I, 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 I actually benefit from using Telegram for my news because on Telegram, you can go to very specific channels and, and you can get like a news feed that's kind of tailored to I don't know what you, so there's one, there's this one news feed that I go to called unlimited hangout. <laughs> And it's interesting also to see what people who, you know, obviously, so you're just there with everybody, with all sorts of people. <clears throat> and uh, so this week on Unlimited Hangout, people were discussing the Travis Scott concert where people died, right? This, was, this would have been about a year ago now at Astro World in Houston. And the image there on the left, <clears throat> I mean, obviously, concerts are a combination of music plus visual arts, right? These, these two things are going on. There's more that going on at concerts than that, but just from the standpoint of. <laughs> <laughs> of what we're discussing here, right? So, it's just a, so but obviously uh, the people on Unlimited Hangout this week, when they were talking about the Travis Scott concert, there's a few people on there who are, they're very, like they, they're much more uh, visually adept than I am. Like they just see more. They're always pointing things out, right, that I think are interesting. But that I myself wouldn't see unless they pointed it out to me. So anyway, so they were pointing to the Travis Scott concert and all the demonic imagery. Right? And these people are not Christian. These are just, you know, people of all sorts, from what I can tell, people of all highs and lows of society even. And then the other thing that came up this week that I thought was relevant was this, this, this image of this actress on a magazine where... 
in the interview, she's talking about drinking blood as a blood ritual, but we don't want, we, you know, don't, let's not get caught up in that. But what's interesting from the image is that this is a kind of play on the celestial virgin, right? The, the tone of the, of the colors, right? The hood, the kind of the, the shape of the hair. And it's also, it's also interesting, the hand in the side, the hand on the, on the chest is Napoleonic. Right? So, so it's, like, it's like you're bringing together interesting images. Like, what are you trying to say by this, right? And then, so someone, someone on, the, this is the, just the post from Telegram, brings up the blood ritual things. But also that Hollywood is a, right, the, the, these images here, I think just the point here is that these images can also be a way of just promoting occult ideas, right? The dark occult, like that's a concern of some of the people on this channel. And by the in general, like, I, I don't want to, like, they're not obsessed with it. It just comes up once in a while. I just want to put it that way, right? I, I don't want to get off. And then someone responds and says, well, yeah, actually, what I just said, Nietzsche wanted to replace images like love for the celestial virgin with pre-Socratic imagery, like what's in the Bacchae. This looks like to me to be a mockery of the classic images of the celestial virgin. The Bacchae is a play about Dionysian rituals, occult sacrifice. <laughs> Right? And then the wicker man comes up and then the person responds and says, well, look at this picture. Right. And this is very classic. You know, one of the images where on the one like sometimes when things are entering into a nebulous area, the imagery will be uh, as above, so below. Right. Like I can point you both to heaven and to hell at the same time. So, <clears throat> again, those, that's just an image that lays out the problem. Right. That, that, so that's why we do this. Now, also in our own day and age, we're getting introduced to all sorts of interesting, like uh, po possibilities or features of beauty and art that are well, just interesting to start to start the conversation a little bit. So, for example, here is uh, what's come up in the last couple of years is uh, non fungible, non fungible tokens. And also people, people creating art on the internet and you can buy the first copy, right? So there's all sorts of things that people have begun to produce on the internet and then people will pay for it, right? Just to have the first internet copy of it, right? So this is one of the, this is one of the non-fungible tokens that's been, that's been sold in the last couple of years. And uh, there's also now Bitcoin art supposedly, right? There is Bitcoin is virtual money. It's kind of, it's a form of virtual money. And then there's others who have tried to form art, create art, if you can say that, using Bitcoin. Or again, here's other, here's some other examples of non-fungible tokens, right? This is art that's, that doesn't, there's no painting, there's no canvas. This is just art that somebody's created on the internet and then sold. And that's where, that's where this is like part of the thesis of, well, at what point does art just become a kind of, a kind of fat, a kind of like, what are you willing to buy? Or what are you willing to pay? What is art? Is art just what you're willing to pay for? Right. Well, then how do you increase the value of something? Is it just through propaganda? Is it just through advertising? Is it just through marketing? Right. Is that art then? And so then this other fellow, uh, this other, here's another example of Bitcoin art where this fellow just went to Central Park and he, he photographed himself with a block of gold, gold looking thing that he made. Or here's another NFT that was sold for $2 million in the last couple of years, <laughs> right? Someone did this, put a picture of Tom Brady's rookie card with him next to it and then got him to sign it. And he created, and then that was sold for like $2 million. Uh, the, just the rights to say, I have the first one. It's not actually a thing. It's just, it's just an image on the internet. And I guess part of the deal is you don't make it into a thing. Like if you make it, in, if you make it, it's, that's not the first thing, right? So anyway, so this kind of introduces us. I, I just, I, I put these things out there just to a little bit introduce us to the problem <clears throat> from like, these are just some examples of, what's out there right now, what's claiming to be art right now. And on the one hand, I think the, the thing of Glamour Magazine, the actress, right? 
that points us to, and Trevor Scott, that points us to the social dimension order of art and how art can be used for good or for ill. These other things, they, they lead us to ask the question, well, is art in the end just the opinion of who's willing to buy it and how much they're willing to pay for it, right? That's, that's actually the, cl the classic philosophical problem that Thrasymachus articulates in the first book of the Republic of Plato, right? where he says justice or truth, we could include beauty. It's simply the opinion of the powerful, right? Or is there something else we can say? Now, <clears throat> obviously in, well, are there any questions with what I've said so far? Because that, that's just the introduction, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but I'm happy you're still awake. Because <laughs> what I'd like to do now is then just get into the philosophical heart of the problem. <clears throat> and I think, again, one of the things about Catholicism is that we've always maintained, going back to the Gospel of St. John, going back to our Lord himself, right, that there is this, we can harmonize faith and reason, right? Because if God is the creator of everything that is, then it's intelligible by the human reason. And there can be a way by which we understand how it fits within the creator's plan for creation. At the same time, because of sin, this is, this is, this is like the fundamental problem of life, right? Because of sin and because of concupiscence, we can always have a disordered attraction to what has been created, anything that's been created, right? That's the great, the great challenge of life <clears throat> is to resolve that tension. And if there's a basic problem, so what's, what's nice about art is that there is, and, and we know this, like I was saying, using the mass at the beginning, there's a long, there's a, again, from the time our Lord has been here, there's a history that we have of understanding the tension that exists in art, whether it's music or poetry or philosophy or literature, or architecture, and trying to resolve it in a way that leads to the transcendental or that directs to the transcendental. And also therefore to point out, well, what are some problems? What are some potential problems? And actually one of the first insights that really helped me on this was one of my one of my mentors in graduate school, a fellow named Ralph McInerney. I didn't put his I didn't do a slide for him. He was a philosophy professor at Notre Dame for 50, 60 years almost. And he died, he died I think in 2015 or so. <clears throat> and in one of the in one of the seminars we were I took with him, he said he, he was also, in addition to being a great philosopher, he also wrote novels. He wrote a bunch of, a bunch of mystery novels that were made into a television series and Father, Father Brown, no, Father, um, anyway, I forget, I forget the, which, what's the last name of the, of the person who was like the, the Columbo figure, the, the guy who resolved the mysteries. But anyway, he wrote these mystery novels. They became a, a, a television series. They became actually very popular in Japan. That was an interesting, interesting point. But anyway, so he was saying when, when, he, when, he, when he was lecturing to us on art and philosophy, one of the things he said is that he realized as a young man that art is on a continuum. And on, on the one side of the continuum, you, you could have, in the case of writing, I know, I know I'm doing it for medium, but you, the same thing could be applied to painting, right? On the one hand, you could have children's stories or you could have popular novels like mystery novels or science fiction, or you could have high literature, right? So on that continuum, there could be things that are done well or poorly. There could be things that are more or less on that continuum. And that's a healthy way. And because you understood this way, you can put almost anything on the continuum and to discuss it. And, and also you could say to yourself, well, I know I'm never going to be like the next Nathaniel Hawthorne or Herbert Melville, but I'm going to write mystery novels and have, make a lot of money doing it and have a good time, right? And that's that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that, that that's an insight that helped me at least start to understand, well, how can you talk about everything in a way that could also appreciate the good or the value of things that are more, like we even say in music, right? There's popular music. What is popular music? It's it's folk music that's supposed to be accessible to everybody. 
as opposed to classical music, which is <clears throat> on a continuum, you could say, well, in each category, there's, there could be a better or worse based on your knowledge of the techniques that, that are involved in it. So, and we can say the same thing with art, right? There's, there's comic books, right? There's, there's children's art, there's, there's graphic novels, right? There's, again, there's paintings of various sorts up to, up to uh, more class, what we would call more classical paintings that, that have, uh, that are more ambitious as far as the philosophy behind them. So in the Catholic world, we do have this capacity to speak about, we have a language to speak about art. And as with all things Catholic, part of it comes from just uh, people who have thought about these things over time, whether they're Catholic or not. And the basic problem here is on this continuum is I, I think the basic contrast here we want to get into is the distinction between formalism and mimesis. And here we want to say, is art formalistic or is it mimetic? And my answer is, it could, you could understand it either way, but mimetic helps you to resolve a number of difficulties that formalism doesn't allow you to resolve. To resolve. And within the Catholic world, and I have to say now, these next characters I'm going to talk about, these next figures I'm going to talk about, I've, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to explain. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, I just want to lay it out. That's the problem. Get your mind spinning a little bit, <laughs> right? And then we'll, uh, and then, and then we'll hopefully, we'll hopefully explain it more as we go on. So I'm going to try to now outline the, the, the problem, the philosophical problem. Now, by the way, all of these fellows, I'm now about to show you their ideas. I have great respect for all of them. I don't think, and either of them is, and actually I think that uh, two of the, the first two characters I mentioned, <clears throat> I think they actually, from a philosophical standpoint, the difficulty is they have, they have like a healthy understanding of nature and metaphysics, but they failed to fully apply it to the area of art. And then the third guy, I think he actually, I think in areas of metaphysics and wider philosophy, he's probably not so good, but he got, he got it right when it came to art, <laughs> right? So it's kind of one of these things where, so now who are these characters? Who are these figures? I just, when I was, I was leaving my house this morning, they said, what are you about to do? I said, well, I'm about to give this lecture on art. And then, and then I, they said, well, can you sum it up for us before you walk out the door? I said, well, only as a grenade. <laughs> And what is that grenade? I said, I'm going to critique Etienne Gilson and Maritain on art. And I'm going to show how they got it wrong. And everyone's like, everyone like got their knives out. Like, how could you do that? <laughs> I said, well, I threw the grenade. Now I have to go. Bye bye. So anyway, so Etienne Gilson, he was a Thomist of the 20. He's probably, these are the, these are the, some of the preeminent Catholic philosophers of the 20th century. One is Etienne Gilson. He taught at Harvard for three years in the 1930s. And Harvard was going to offer him a full-time job to be a full, a full professor. And right at that moment, he was asked by a religious order to go to Toronto and to start an institute at Toronto. And when I hear this story, it's like it tears my heart apart. But anyway, he went to Toronto <laughs> in the 1930s. But he, he's, he's a great man. He's met, he wrote many excellent books on the history of philosophy and <clears throat> many insights into metaphysics. And he started this institute, which now has no longer exists, unfortunately. But one of his books, of course, is Art and the Intellect in the in, – in, uh, sorry, one of his books – this is a book uh, about his aesthetics philosophy, his philosophy of art. Art and Intellect in the Philosophy of Etienne Gilson. And then the other fellow here is Jacques Maritain, who wrote a book called Art and Scholasticism. And essentially, what these fellows do, this is the formalistic theory, right? They say, they, they go back to Plato. Here's this, this is in this, in, uh, next to the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, right? So there's this famous painting with Plato, Raphael's Plato is looking up to the heavens. And then 
Aristotle is kind of saying, let's look out to the earth, right? So the, the vertical and the horizontal. <clears throat> and so Plato basically, Plato said that, actually he came up with a great insight that's super important, that everything is composed of form and matter, right? So in you, in every one of us, the, for, the, the soul is the form of the body. Our body is material, our soul is invisible or immaterial, and the two are united so as to create one person. So we are, we are, we are all composed of matter and, soul, matter and form. We are all body and soul, right? <clears throat> and so Plato comes up with this idea which helps to explain a lot, <laughs> right? And we could go through the history of philosophy and explain that if, you, if, if we had to, maybe next in another course. But, but then the question becomes, well, where do these forms, did, can forms exist outside of what is material? Right, that's the question. <clears throat> and Plato says there's a realm of ideas. There's a realm of forms. We're, we're kind of, we're doing a cheap explanation of it, but Plato says there's a realm of forms that exists somewhere in the heavens. <clears throat> and then, so what we see in front of us is the realm of the senses, the realms of matter. So there's kind of this divide between the form and matter. <clears throat> and so what Etienne Gilson and what Jacques Maritain say when they apply this to art, they say, what is art? Art is someone accessing the forms that exist in the heaven, the ideas, the transcendentals, right? The one, the true, the good, and the beautiful. And what they try to do is with, with the skills that they learn, <clears throat> how to paint, different colors, what colors look like. I mean, there's all sorts of skills you can learn as far as creating art. So with the skills that they learn, they can manipulate matter in order to reveal the realm of the forms or not. And Gilson and Maritain, they say there's obviously a danger of formalism. <clears throat> there's obviously a danger of taking aspects of material reality and treating them as the forms. And we'll, we'll explain this. We're going to kind of tease this out more and more as we go through. We're going to get more and more layers of complexity as we go through. <clears throat> so, and by the way, the little prince... Well, I'll get to the little prince in a minute. So anyway, so that's 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 the kind of the beginning of form. That, that's a, not the beginning of. That's a kind of summary position of Maritain and Gilson. And what Maritain and Gilson end up doing, especially like Maritain, is they'll say, "Well, you take all this modern art. You take Warhol. You take Picasso. You take all this modern art. And what are they doing? These are people that are just they're exploring <clears throat> they're exploring matter independently of the forms." And it would be inappropriate to kind of force them to, have, to connect matter somehow with the forms. Now, in a way, this is problematic because why? <clears throat> this is problematic, and the person who says this is problematic is Umberto Eco. And <clears throat> Eco... Echo essentially argues that the problem with theories of art, like those of Gilson and Maritain, is that they don't apply the, the normal understanding of realistic philosophy to the world of art. And what does he mean by that? What he means by that is that he says, <clears throat> we're in philosophy, we're always trying to understand nature. Right? Nature is something that's given. Nature is before us. And yes, we use the categories of form and matter to explain nature that's before us. But ultimately, <clears throat> we don't separate them. Ultimately, right, you are composed of soul and body. You are right now form and matter. We don't separate them into two spheres. And in fact, 
one of the, this is what Aristotle said about Plato. Aristotle said, yes, everything has a form, but the forms don't exist in the ether somewhere up there, <clears throat> right? The forms have to exist in real things. <clears throat> and so Umberto Eco says, and we're going to, we're going to go more into this. We're going to go into more and more into this as we, as we go through here. But Echo, Echo reminds us that if, if art, art is mimetic, art is trying to, and Aristotle understood, our Aristotle says in the Poetics, Aristotle says, what is art? Art is fundamentally mimetic, mimesis. Mim something that's mimetic means that it's imitating and it's remembering. Right? It's imitating, it's remembering, it's recalling something. <clears throat> and so Echo says that if one of the things that Aquinas, one of, one of Aquinas's great insights, and which Gilson and Maritain understood when they were dealing with metaphysics, is that in order to fully explain reality in order to fully explain reality you can't just limit your explanation to form and matter ultimately you can say that everything that exists whether it's a table an angel a person an animal or god everything that exists has an essence or a nature and it has an existence. Everything that exists has essence and existence. <clears throat> and this, this problem is actually pointed out in the beginning of The Little Prince. So Saint Exupéry, the author of The Little Prince, if you, rem if you recall the book or if you've ever read it, if not, I'll just give a little summary here. <clears throat> uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the opening chapters, the, the author is a little boy. And he's a little boy who loves art. And what does he drew? He draws, he draws an elephant that has been swallowed by a snake. And he shows this, he shows this picture, he shows this image to adults. And adults never understand what he's done, right? They, they all say, well, that's a, that's a hat, right? And he says, well, no, it's not a hat. I, the artist, right, I drew a snake that had swallowed an elephant. It's also, it's weird how things happen, right? Also this week, I didn't, I didn't put the slide up. I just didn't have time. But just yesterday, I saw a slide of how did dinosaurs come about? And this, this person drew a series of slides, like three or four slides, of a snake swallowing an elephant. <laughs> like that's, that, and that created dinosaurs. <laughs> it would have been a nice little photo to put in here. <laughs> but. Uh, this is this is one of the tensions that's in the little prince is that this little boy who's an artist he has an insight into the essence of reality into the essence of things and he's trying to draw out some aspect of that essence but as a little boy he can't explain what he's just done this is something that socrates says in the apology he says when i went and spoke to the artists i realized that the artists when they reproduce whatever whatever it is they create, whether it's sculpture or painting or music, they 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 have a power, they have a gift that gives them insight into the nature of things, but they don't know how to explain it. <laughs> they don't know how to they don't know how to describe what they've just done. So the artist needs the philosopher, right? He needs the philosopher needs the artist because the philosopher is not creative in the way that the artist is creative. But on the other hand, the artist oftentimes can't articulate what he's done. And so he needs the philosopher to give an explanation. And that's, that's the dilemma that's at the beginning of The Little Prince. But this, this reality that there is an essence or nature to things and that we can draw that essence out. The artist can highlight an aspect of the essence of things. That's art as being mimetic, right? That's art as saying the artist sees reality. Right? He sees 
and reality is any any one thing in reality could be composed of many different things, many different colors, many different shapes. And, but also everything that is does participate in some way in God's creation. So everything that is, when you when you reproduce it in a work of art, you're going to be reproducing some elements of the essence of things. You're going to be imitating and trying to draw out some essence of what is there. <clears throat> if art is too realistic, it's no longer art. It's no longer imitation. Right? If I say, I mean, just, this is absurd, right? If you think about it. If I say to you, here I am, and then I come over here and I say, now I'm art. <laughs> well, no, I mean, that's absurd, right? It's just, it, it's not. So there can be, art can become, and, and you, what you see happening in art, in the history of art, is that art will, there'll be like an ebb and a flow between, on the one hand, formalism, on the other hand, a rejection of formalism, and then an excessive realism. And then there'll be a, there'll be a movement back, right? And within that, there will be some who will come up with what I would call like the mimetic synthesis that gives us a new appreciation of, the, they're, they're able to bring out the essence of things in a way that's very interesting. <clears throat> and again, we eventually the fox teaches the little prince, right? With the heart, one can see rightly what is essential is invisible to the eye, right? Part of, part of the part of what the philosopher teaches the artist is how to describe the essence of the thing that he has seen. So, if art, and this is from Umberto Eco now, if art is mimetic. It's always going to it's always going to seek the intermediate between the extremes. And again, when we understand the intermediate, the extremes here being the the tensions where it could go off the rails in one way or the other, <clears throat> right? And so the the intermediate here, this this applies to art, it applies to virtue, it applies to everything. You'll you'll hear especially eighteen year old boys always talk about this. Well, you, we should be moderate in everything, right? I, I heard that all the time from freshmen when I taught. Right. Try to have balance in everything. Right. They would always say that balance in everything. That's like the 18 year old boy approach to life. But. <laughs> but the, the problem with that is that and this goes and Aquinas was very saw this right. The, the middle point, the virtue or the excellence in a thing is not the mean between the two or balance. It's actually the middle. It's the high point between the two, right? It's the mountaintop, <laughs> right? So it's not just, well, you know, and th this is very important when it comes to virtue. So it's not just like, well, if I'm gonna live virtue, I do a little bit of this, a little bit of good and a little bit of bad, and then I become virtuous. Well, no, <laughs> right? That's, a, that's the mean between the, that's balance. That's, that's mediocrity, right? That's the, that's, the, that's the middle, the 18 year old boy, mediocrity, the middle, <laughs> right? So we can judge, if we, if we acquire the vocabulary, we're going to be able to judge art as being either excessive on one side or excessive on the other, right? Having an excess or a defect on one side or the other. <clears throat> there will be some, according to the mimetic, uh, this is Umberto Ecker now, there will be some who will... They'll be like the, the archer that hits the bullseye, right? There'll be some who understand all the di dimensions of all the tensions that are involved. Just like when you shoot an arrow, there's tensions that are involved, but eventually you get it right. So now how can we apply metaphysics to art? Metaphysics is a science of reality, right? Science, what is science? An ordered body of knowledge of causes. How do you distinguish between the sciences? Well, from what point of view are you looking at things? What aspect of things are you looking at? 
what, you know, so uh, this is like super simplistic, right? But physics looks at things that are in motion, right? Chemistry or biology looks at things as much as they have life. Well, at some point, you do ask the question, well, what is life? When you're, right? Or you ask the question, well, what, what does it mean to move as opposed to not move? Or you might ask the question, what does it mean to be as opposed to not be? Well, so ph philosophy is the science that gives you an ordered body of knowledge about those things which are oftentimes assumed by the material sciences motion or life or existence. What does it mean to exist as opposed to not exist, right? So philosophy is scientific, which is properly done. And metaphysics is, uh, metaphysics is a science about what does it mean to exist as opposed to not exist. And one of the basic principles of metaphysics is that everything that exists, everything that is real, it first comes to us through our senses. And ultimately, this is, the, uh, this is the ultimate basis of the mimetic theory of art. It's based on this metaphysical insight. Right? Existence is the form that calls essence into being. This is the insight that Gilson and Maritain understood when they spoke about reality, but that they failed to apply to art. <laughs> and that's what Echo, that's what Umberto Echo points out. Right? If you go back to that image from the little prince, <clears throat> the the artist in the little prince, he had some notion of the existence of a snake and of an elephant. And he knew how to bring them into being in a certain way. He couldn't explain it, but he at least knew how to create it. But also, this is, this is another point, which we could flesh out if we had to, but the most perfective element of a thing, of a substance, is the fact that it exists and not its form. Right. If you're when when you're in after you die, right, your soul and your body are separated until the end of time. You're not fully you until your body and soul are reunited at the end of time. Right. You're, when your body and soul are separated, you're not you're not you don't live anymore. You're not you're not whole. You're not perfect in that sense. Right. So the fact that you exist is prior to that you have these two parts, body and soul. That's more perfective of you. So when someone, when someone is engaged in a work of art, someone is creating something that is, that exists. It's something that is, but that it also highlights an aspect of being. Let's see. Now, what makes a thing beautiful? There's three, there's three aspects of something that's beautiful, right? And I kind of, well, I just, I think ballet actually, or it might be helpful here in the sense that like, wait, what's it, what, why ballet, there's different motions or poses that exemplify some aspect of beauty. So for example, one aspect of beauty is wholeness or integrity, right? So when the ballet dancer goes like this, right? That's a, that's a symbol of wholeness, right? And when you, learn, when you learn the symbols, right? When you learn the skills or the techniques, then you learn what the techniques signify. Don't worry, I'm not gonna spin around. <laughs> Stay calm. <laughs> Right? The other, the other aspect of beauty is proportion or harmony. Right? And that's why there will be the, again, I won't do, I won't do too much, right? But they'll, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they'll, you know, there'll be the different, the different motions of the body out, 
right? Because why? That creates proportion. Right? And when you when you observe the body, right? When you observe the body, you can you can you can appreciate the the harmony or the proportion that exists between the various parts. Now, actually, for Aquinas, <clears throat> the, these two aspects of beauty are like they're like one third of what of beauty. The third aspect is actually the most important part, like sixty six percent, and that's brightness or clarity. Right. So, in, in, if we're if you're saying a human, if you're saying an, an a, a person is beautiful, well, a small part of it is wholeness, integrity, right? Is everything there, right? Part of it is also proportion or harmony between the various parts. But the biggest aspect for beauty is actually the, uh, the brightness of the soul, which is why in painting, there's this one church in Rome on the top of the Chalian Hill. It's, uh, it's, it's, I think the church is called Mary, the Gate of Heaven. And in the back of the church, there's a, there's a fresco. And in the fresco, there's a figure who has a square halo. So it's not a halo. It's just a square thing of light. Right? Well, why? why is actually, that helps us date the painting. Why? Because in the, in the tradition of art, if someone's a saint, well, how do you, how do you show in the figure that their soul is beautiful? You, you show a halo, right? The halo is a sign of the beauty of the soul. Well, if the person is still living, but they have a reputation for holiness, how do you show that? You don't draw a circle, you draw a, a light, a square. You draw a square of gold over their head as opposed to a circle over their head, right? So this one fresco, that's how they knew how to paint this fresco, Our Lady uh, Gate of Heaven on the top of the Chalian Hill in Rome. So in the mimetic theory of art then, Part, you know, these are some of the qualities you're going to look for in the art itself. It's integrity, it's proportion, and then it's brightness or clarity. It's brightness or clarity. That's what causes this wonder in the soul that we're speaking about, right? That we, that we mentioned in the very beginning, the eros, right? The sense of wonder, the awe. And wonder is more than just, well, I like this and I don't like that, right? It's, it's something more than that. Art is related, beauty is related to goodness. Why? Because what we see, if it's pleasant, if it gives us joy, if it gives us dopamine, <laughs> right? Then it satisfies our appetites. We desire, we, we need dopamine, right? to use more modern scientific language. Right? We, that helps to give us joy. So the question is, can you get it in the right way? <laughs> right? That's always the, uh, that's the big challenge. So there is a, there, there's an aspect of art also that has an end or a purpose. Ultimately, if art can cause wonder in us, if it can cause a sense of wonder, it also is moving in the direction of contemplation. I learned this for the first time in my life when I was in France and I went to a museum with two French men. They wanted, they, we went on a special trip to Lyon to look at a 19th century painting, which is in the Museum of Lyon of the girl playing the piano. And they, we got to the room where the girl, play, where is, there's the painting of the girl playing the piano. And they, they spent like an hour and a half walking in and out of the room, looking at the painting from different pictures, talking about different aspects of it. And I, again, being like a, ugly American. I mean, like our way of going through museums is like five seconds for each painting, right? Can, can we get through the whole thing? <laughs> but anyway, so that's not the French way of going through a museum, <laughs> right? But no, but you, you could appreciate, I could really appreciate after being with these two guys that, that, well, they, when they got to a painting, they really knew how to appreciate it to the point of contemplation, right? It almost led them out of themselves. Now, we want to now look at 
just a little bit, a brief glimpse into the history of art with some of these ideas in mind to understand on the one hand where formalism can lead us, on the other hand, where an excessive realism could lead us, and then how that, how that, how that tension could be resolved in a way where you're like hitting the bullseye. But before I do that, are there any questions about what I've said so far? Yes. Oh yeah, of course, of course. I think I think I, I would actually say in the, in how like in the formalistic theory of art, it can very quickly become all subjective. Why? Because there's no difference between what's in my mind and your mind. <clears throat> I would say in the mimetic theory of art you ultimately have a way of appreciating the subjective element, but also uh, d engaging in a kind of dialogue where you could come up with a, with, with a judgment of also where your subjectivity fits into it. Yes. Yeah, so so what's the difference between essence and form? <clears throat> so basically this essence and form would come down to this that the more we understand about reality, we have to make more distinctions in order to accurately understand reality, in order to actually ac accurately explain reality. Right? So the first insight, it's like I mean think of it like think of it just think of it along li along uh, these lines. Uh, Plato and Aristotle, when they are dealing with philosophy of nature, right, they, they spend a lot of time trying to explain what is motion? What are the various qualities of things that move or of things that are? Eventually we get to Newton and Newton says, well, gravity, right? You need to postulate gravity in order to fully explain motion, right? So the difference between form and essence, it's, it's like the difference between talking about Motion and gravity, or introducing gravity into how you describe motion, right? So it's a further specification that helps you explain reality. What do I mean, right? What I mean by, just think of the human person, right? I am composed of body and soul. My, my soul is my form, my body is my matter. But what is my nature? I'm a human person. My nature is my body and soul and spirit composed into one being. And my nature is I'm a human being. So I'm not, I'm not just my soul, which is my form. I'm my soul and my body, which is both together. That's my essence. So nature and essence understood in this way are interchangeable. But if you want to be like super technical, for essence is a, a little bit of a better word. <clears throat> it explains more. So another way of another way of saying it would be like uh, we have genus and species, right? Well, essence is my species. Yes. So, I think it's a little bit, I think there's a little distinct. So, yeah, what brightness of soul. So, when applied to virtue, brightness of soul is what happens when the soul is acquiring virtues and living according to them. In the case of art, the, the, the element of brightness or clarity is more what the art evokes as far as wonder in, in, the, in the one who observes it. Yes. Can you repeat again how you summarize the formalistic So the formula, we're, we're, we're going to get more into this when we look at the paintings. I, I, think, I think once we get through the paintings, you'll, 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 see, you'll see it more fleshed out. <clears throat> So 
So the conflict here, the tension that arises during the Renaissance is the tension between, on the one hand, formalism. On the other, because the Renaissance is like a breaking away from formalism. It's in painting. But an, there's an aspect of the Renaissance that leads to an excessive realism. And oftentimes, at least, I'm, 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 I've gone through the Vatican Museum so many times. <clears throat> and oftentimes, even like at the, even when, when the tour guides take you through the Vatican Museum, even the good ones, they tend to not say, they don't give the full picture. Right? They'll, they'll, they'll always take you to the Sistine Chapel and they'll say, you see that guy in hell? He's a cardinal and Michelangelo put him in hell because he wanted to have everything covered up, right? Like he was a prude. Right? That's, that's the typical, like that cardinal was, was a prude. He thought that, you know, there were too many body parts being exposed and Michelangelo wanted to stick it to him. So we put him in hell in the final judgment, right? That's a typical, at least I've gotten that presentation of the Sistine Chapel like 10 times in my life. Right. But that doesn't tell you the whole story. I think I think there's, there's an element of the story that's left out in the typical tour. And actually, Mike, even Michelangelo's role in the story. And it's this it, what it is, is it is that there was a kind of breaking away from a kind of formalism in the Renaissance. But that breaking away from formalism, it went to f certain elements of it go too far in a certain direction. And actually, Michelangelo was trying to correct Actually, the church going up to the Council of Trent was trying to correct that excessive. So what, and it's, the tension here can be seen in two paintings by Titian. <clears throat> Titian's Noli Me Tangere, which we're, which we're showing you here. It, this, is, this is an example of, of, if you look at it, using the mimetic theory of art, you can see how attention is present and he's also resolving it. Earlier in his life, he did Venus and the organ player. And here the tension, he's, he's, he, there's a defect. He's giving in to a kind of more pornographic, what we, what we would now call more pornographic, excessive realism, excessive eroticism. And that's oftentimes the, that's oftentimes the, what, one of the things that develops in the Renaissance. This is like a piece of the puzzle that is oftentimes not presented. <laughs> Right? Is it, it's also in the Renaissance that you get the, the first widespread distribution of this like impure art. Uh, and Titian was affected by this. His best friend was a, 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 an artist named Avent, he, uh, not an artist, a fellow named Aventino. <clears throat> and Aventino, as part of the whole development of the Renaissance, Mardi Gras, <laughs> the bread and circus of the Renaissance, Aventino working with some of the ruling families in Florence and whatnot, he worked out this theory that, well, you can actually widely distribute excessively erotic paraphernalia and it will help you to enslave the people. I mean, that was, that was his idea. It will help you just get people focused on one thing. We've already said this, mimesis, the imitation of nature, So let me get here. Now, in the Middle Ages, in the early Middle Ages, they had they didn't have access to Aristotle. They had access to Plato. So had they had the access to on the one hand there's the realm of ideas, the forms. Right? On the other hand, the person who's creating, what is he trying to do? He's trying to take what's from the realm of ideas and he's trying to instantiate it in matter, the, the artist, the creator. He's co-creating with God, right? Not a bad project. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. So looking back to the Greek world and what was like, one of the big things that Plato was into was geometry, triangles, circles. I have a friend who, when he was in high school, he became enamored with the golden mean or the golden proportion. And he can give like, he can give you a three hour lecture on the golden proportion, right? <laughs> <I'm> like stop, <laughs> because he can see it in everything. 
right? The golden proportion exists in everything. Well, but again, it's not, it's, again, if you think about it, it's not irrational that you would think that, why? Because what do, what do the ancient geom- what do the ancient astronomers do? They, they look to the heavens and they see geometric patterns in the heavens. They see circles and triangles and all sorts of interesting things. And, and again, for them, that gives you an insight into that there's an awe that's experienced. There's a wonder that's experienced. But that helps to kind of give birth to geometry as a science. And so Plato, like if you went to Plato's Academy, he would make you study geometry for 10 years, right? You had to kind of go through Euclid's geometry step by step. <clears throat> and uh, so anyway, so artists of the Middle Ages, they tend to use this, they have this platonic background into how they start to do art. And you, you can see there are things that are done that are very beautiful using this, using these proportions, right? So here's an example of people started to notice the proportion in the symbol for Jesus. And they would, they would then see that proportion in a certain way in which you could present circles and triangles to get the golden mean. And then you could imitate that in a piece of art, in an icon. Or you could go further than simple, uh, well, I don't want to say simple, but you could go further than simple iconography, right? In order to, in order to portray in a formalistic way, the proportions. <clears throat> Here's an example. This is the, the door of the old Notre Dame Cathedral. This is the, so my friend that like loves the golden mean, he'll point to this Piero della Francesca, the baptism of Christ. It's like the, it's like the painting that is the pinnacle of formalistic art. And when you look at the painting, when you look at the painting uh, independently of all these little lines, right? It's actually quite a beautiful painting. There, 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 is a, there is a kind of realism that he can present while at the same time holding to all of these proportionate uh, all these proportions, all these lines, triangles and circles that conform to the golden mean. Right? So a formalist would say this is this is like the height of medieval formalism. And and it can produce a kind of beauty. <clears throat> the what we see happening as the Middle Ages goes on though is that you do get a kind of breaking out of formalism, a de- artists who begin to depart from formalism, like Giotto is one of them, right? Giotto, sorry, Giotto. You can't, and and people would cre- people would critique his art because they would say, I don't see the lot. I mean, I don't see the proportions in it. That, that for example, we saw in the Piero della Francesca uh, earlier, right? They would say, I don't see the proportions in it. I don't see how you could say that's art. And so he was actually like shocking for people because he was, but uh, on the mimetic theory of art, you could say, well, while he's departing from the shapes and the lines, he's still giving us figures that give us a kind of insight into the reality of things or into the essence of things. And then you also get, start to get this in the, the, the Très Réture de Duc de Barry, right? You start to get also, these are, these are books that are illuminated with paintings, like graphic novels, right? I guess we would call them now graphic novels, right? But you can also see, you can also see in these paintings, the beginning of, well, going too far in the direction of trying to be fully realistic, and also kind of changing, changing the changing arrows 
from wonder to excessive pleasure for the one who's watching it or for the one who's observing it. So Umberto Eco says, <clears throat> it's healthy. It, what's dangerous in art or what, what one, one potential error of the formalistic error would be that geometry becomes the master of mimesis or mimesis. Geometry as the handmaid to mimesis, you could actually see how it produces something beautiful. The danger is to once the danger is once you reject for if you reject formalism, the danger at that point is that you end up turning art into almost an exclusively mimetic affair. And this is the this is what both happens to this is what happens in the Renaissance. You'll see it in the paintings of Botticelli, you'll see it in some of the paintings of Titian. They were friends with this fellow Aventino. And so they sometimes will take art to be too mimetic, limiting Eros not to wonder, not being open to, open to wonder, to the transcendent, to beauty, but almost like limiting it to a certain aspect of the human mind, the left brain, as opposed to the right brain, right? And so you start to see, for example, and by the way, there, I have a, there's a story here where Botticelli himself, there's this famous character in Florence who, for the most part, gets a bad name, but I think he's more complicated in a good way, is uh, Savonarola. He rules in Florence, or he doesn't rule, but his people rule in Florence in the 1490s. And Savonarola... So basically, before the four, in the 1450s, 1460s, that's the birth of the Renaissance. And part of the birth of the Renaissance is a social problem, right? The, 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 uh, the oligarchs, the Medici family and the others who rule in Florence, Florence is becoming wealthy based on textiles, the production of textiles. And actually, there's a professor at Harvard who got uh, Harvard's archives have the Medici family accounting logs. And there's a professor at Harvard who has gotten tenure based on using these accounting logs to come up with all sorts of insights into like how people got paid and the social order and whatnot. And uh, one of the things that you see is that in the, in the, in the 1300s and into the early 1400s, the Medici family is doing everything it can to reduce the wages of the workers. And that's this classic, if you're motivated by making money, one way to reduce costs is to reduce the wages of the workers. And there's all sorts of clever ways, clever, not so good clever, to come up with doing this. For example, one of the things they would do is they would pay them with silver and they would debase the silver. And then they would ask them to be paid back, that their debts had to be paid back in gold, right? But they wouldn't debase the gold, <laughs> right? So they, the, the, the workers would go into debt and then they would have to pay more and more silver back in order to get the gold to repay their debts. It's just a scheme. It's a fraudulent scheme. But over time, the, the, the more you reduce the wages of workers, they can't buy even buy bread for their families anymore. And then they revolt, <laughs> right? And actually St. Catherine of Siena, in Siena, at, at the, towards the end of her life, was one of the first great revolts, worker revolts, the Chompy Rebellion of uh, 1478. And <clears throat> these were just peasants, basically, who they, they, were, they were so poor, they could no longer buy bread for their families. And so they revolt. Well, the whole, one of the purposes of the Renaissance is somebody came up with a scheme. Well, how do you prevent the workers from getting too upset? And at the same time, how do you take their money from them? Bread and circus, right? <laughs> have Mardi Gras, have this big time before Lent where just lots of pleasures, lots of fun things to do, lots of entertainment. They'll forget about their troubles. They'll give you all their money and then they can go enjoy Lent, right? <laughs> right, so that was, so that was 
but, but that was part of the birth of the Renaissance. And so part of the birth of the Renaissance was also Aventino coming up with his form of art. And people who were friends with him, like Botticelli and Titian, they also got a little bit caught up in this. And so you can see, for example, in some of the paintings of Botticelli, where he goes, he's going in that direction of excessive imitation for a less than noble erotic interest. And so eventually when Savonarola comes to power in the 1490s, or his people come to power in Florence in the 1490s, one of the things they do is they put an end to Mardi Gras. And, and the other thing they do is they, he, he establishes this thing called the, uh, the, the procession of purity and virtue. And he, what, what they do is they have boys who had been abused go door to door, kind of encouraging people on the one hand to give money to start a credit union so that people can exchange money without losing money. On the other hand, the boys go around encouraging people to throw out into the bonfire of the vanities anything that they feel led them into sin. I mean, this is the origin of the, of the term, the bonfire of the vanities. So Botticelli, who's living in Florence at that time, he takes paintings, not this one exactly, but paintings that were worse than this one. And he, he had had a conversion by that point. So he threw those paintings into the fire, right? And so did, uh, so did uh, Titian some of his paintings. And actually someone who was a follower of Savonarola was Michelangelo, right? When Michelangelo sets out to be an artist, he does so thinking that Savonarola is a martyr, that Savonarola got it right in a way by not, it, because Savonarola didn't, there was a certain element of false art that Savonarola thought this brings people into sin. We got we to gotta get rid of it. And Michelangelo accepted that, right? And that's, this, that's the aspect of the story that they never tell you in the Vatican Museum, right? That he, he himself was aware of the excess and the defect of formalism on the one hand and this kind of excessive purient interest on the other hand. So here's just a little picture of Savonarola and the bonfire of the vanities. Michelangelo. I think this is a good place to stop. Well, here's a picture of Arantino, the, the guy that, who went excessively in one direction. And then again, the paintings of Titian. Titian himself would sometimes consider himself closer to Aventino. And then, for example, in, in the Noli Me Tangere, there is the tension there of an excessive mimetic desire, but he resolves it and the way he portrays the painting. I think this is a good place to stop because we said 11.45. In, after Islam in the Byzantine Empire, where there's a, basically, it, it starts because of people losing battles. There's always this danger of associating God's favor with winning battles. And as Islam gets started and for about, for about its first thousand years, the Muslims don't lose many battles. <laughs> And the Byzantines do lose battles. And so there's a movement that begins within the Byzantine Empire that basically says, well, maybe the Muslims are right because they're winning all these battles. And the reason that they're right is that we're painting icons. We're offending, you know, we're, we're showing images of saints and God and Jesus. And so we're being punished militarily. We're losing because of, because of this. And well, of course, that, that problem gets resolved by the ninth century where the church says no, right? There's no problem producing images. Why? Because we are created in the image of God. When we, when we engage in art, we are participating in God's creative powers. And when we're showing Christ and the saints, we're showing the image of God, which is what we're called, we're called to be co-creators. So we're just doing what God has called us to do. 
Iconoclasm rises up again in the Reformation. And of course, this is a picture of the sack of Rome. <clears throat> and one of the things that the iconoclasts say is that they look at the excesses of the earlier century, especially Aventino and that brand of mimetic replication of, of reality. And they basically, you know, they throw out the, to use a cliche, they throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? They say, well, let's just get rid of all images. No images of the saints, no images of Jesus, no images of the Trinity, just get rid of it all. Why? So that the word of God is the only thing that stands forth. So you'll go into many churches that are not Catholic and what's the basic architecture? It's a, it's a room or a building with a podium from which the word of God is spoken and maybe some music, right? Depending on the church. So there's a tension, you might say, there's a historical tension as of the time of the Council of Trent. Because at least from, a, from the standpoint of aesthetic theory and practice, those who were clearly Catholic, their theory by the, by the Council of Trent is the formalistic theory of art. We're calling down forms from the heavens and putting them in matter. So the, the, the mimetic theory of art, where, where, which is basically existence is calling essence into being, right? That theory has not yet entered into the mind of the artists. And so left with that, you're going to, and then to some degree, you're always going to have an ebb and flow when it comes to art, architecture, literature, politics. There's always going to be like an ebb. I think one of the ways of best understanding history is there's an ebb and flow. The tide comes in, the tide goes out. <laughs> Sometimes it comes in a lot uh, faster and higher than other times of the year. It can vary from time to time also. So when you get to the Council of Trent, you have these different positions. You have the formalistic theory of art. You have the other, on the other side, you have the Aventino theory of art, which is excessive realism for for vicious, for basically for power and control. On the other side, you also have iconoclasm, which says, let's just get rid of all art and just have the word of God. And so Trent, the Council of Trent has to deal with this problem, not only in art, but also in music and poetry, right? And dance, it's, 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 not a, it's not a unique problem to painting. And of course it's connected, obviously in the church, it's connected with how we worship God because it's part of the liturgy as well. So the guy, the figure here who's interesting as far as articulating a theory of art that is non-formalistic, but that it also is compatible with uh, openness to the transcendental or the tra transcendent is Borromeo, Federico Borromeo. And he, he basically expresses a kind of mimetic theory of art which seems to draw from this kind of these Thomistic metaphysical insights that we articulated earlier. Art as being drawing essence into existence. And Borromeo thinks that the human face is a way by which an artist can show the wisdom of God. Right, it's the, the, the eyes are the window to the soul. It's the face contains the brain or the mind. So Bar Borromeo says things like this, nothing on earth demonstrates God's wisdom as much as the face of a man, his only rational creature. Man could express all of his thoughts and feelings through his face without speaking or gesturing or writing. The grace and charm of a face separates him from all other creatures which are not capable of reason. And again, going, this is not a new, going back to the ancient world, portraying the face is not a, is not, was not foreign to, to the Greeks, for example. You can see in, sculpt, in ancient sculpture, the attempts to like the, the middle one here is Pericles, the great, the great leader of Athens at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War. 
or these images of Zeus. Someone threw in here, he attempts to imitate Shania Twain <laughs> by various actresses. <laughs> Titian, again, here you see him focusing on the face at one point and showing, portraying Mary Magdalene. <clears throat> We're skipping over something here, but because I want to get to, so in the, in the, the Council of Trent, it's very interesting, the Council of Trent, It's very interesting how art develops in Europe after the Council of Trent. Richelieu, who was in the early 1600s, Richelieu was uh, the, the cardinal who was like the, the cardinal primate of France. He blocked the Council of Trent from being implemented in France because he wanted the French church to remain, keep, uh, it's more complicated than what I'm going to say, but we don't have all day, right? But he wanted the, he wanted the French church in a way to develop a real politique, develop its own politics, independent of the other Catholic powers of Europe. And part of what, what he did along those lines is he blocked the Council of Trent from being implemented in the seminaries and churches of France. And what's really interesting after this point in the history of art is that the ebb and flow in France after this point of art tends to go between, uh, this, is, this is where you get, for example, in France, the development of naturalism. You know, uh, I, I didn't have time to put it in here, but artists will draw like by animal body parts, right? They'll paint animal body parts. I think some of it can be very interesting. I'm not, I'm not denying. But then you get, you'll get a reaction against that. You'll get, a reaction against that will be the classicism of David during the French Revolution, right? He'll go back to the excessive, kind of an excessive formalism. And then after the French Revolution, you'll get a kind of, again, back and forth. I remember my, one of my first art history teachers, he was very big on, he was very big on, thinking back on it now, he just died, but he must have been taken, I never asked him this, if he was taken up with more of the mimetic theory of art. His father, he was the son of a painter. His father was a painter. And uh, he would, he, he, I remember him showing us paintings of the history in the history of art, like from 1800 to the present. And one of the things he said, he said, you can see over time how essence starts to disintegrate almost into nothing in the history of art. Because you, in one generation, he says, you'll get the impressionists. Again, art is a, art gives you a kind of insight into the essence of things. And certain artists in certain moments can use their techniques to highlight certain aspects of the essence of things. So that's what impressionism will do. But then you'll get a further development of impressionism to, well, to like where you're almost pulling apart reality, this Picasso. And then you get also with photography, you get a further, a further another, another way of going in the direction of excessive realism. Like Jack, you know, again, by the time you get to the middle of the 20th century, one reaction against any kind of realism is Jackson Pollock and, you know, that school of, of, uh, of art. You know, the, the famous saying of the, the two gangsters standing in front of a Jackson Pollock painting. And the one gangster turns to the other and says, I really like this guy. He makes everything look like an accident. I think Rubens and in the Netherlands, because it was a Spanish colony, there was a full implementation of uh, the Council of Trent. And I think Rubens is an example of a, of a guy who, if we go back, if we go back, I think the mimetic theory of art would lead us to say, well, art can be on a continuum. There's ways we can talk about different things, different pieces of art on that continuum, their value. And then there are some things that are going to hit closer to the target, closer to the bullseyes than others. So I actually think in Rubens, you get, there, there's no formalism in Rubens, or there's, it's, it's hard to find the, the formalistic approach to art in Rubens. You do get this emphasis, this kind of mimetic emphasis on the face, 
I, I saw this art, this piece when it was uh, in the, the Toledo Museum of Art uh, back a few years ago. It's interesting how these things can make their way around. <clears throat> but so you see in Rubens, on the one hand, the capacity to imitate nature, it's very mimetic in that sense. On the other hand, it resolves certain uh, tendencies to go too far in the direction of realism and also too far towards vice. And on the other hand, it does, he has a way of painting things that points us to something outside of ourselves. And I think his, his painting of the, uh, the princess Spinola Doria is, is a great example of the, uh, of the resolution of these tensions that developed in the late Middle Ages into the Renaissance and throughout the Reformation. On the one hand, of, a kind of overcoming the limitations of formalism, right? On the other hand, imitating nature, but not a slavish imitation of nature, right? To the point of saying it's not really art, or it's just very limited in how it's imitating nature. And then portray, giving us a painting that does draw out the, the essence of the person, right? Through, through highlighting the face. And also showing, uh, displaying in the way that he paints the, the development that had taken place in the, in the skills and the techniques that were used in portraying color. Right. And it's it's not there were there were paintings you can find at this time that are so realistic that it almost looks like a photograph. It almost looks like a color photograph. So he avoids doing he I think in this painting he avoids doing that. Right. So if so <clears throat> then just the last point would be you do see reactions also in the modern world against this this kind of uh breaking up of the forms i think oftentimes what happens in modern painting in the 20th century is you don't get artists creating their art on on the mimetic continuum you get them either accepting or rejecting formalism and so you'll you'll get hyper realism on the one hand or rejection of it by just emphasizing technique and skill on the other hand so in a reaction against Pollock and a kind of Picasso and Cubism, you get these, you get some Italians in the mid 20th century that go in this direction of like Pietro Anonini is one of them, right? They do these kind of realistic paintings. And here's, here's a quote from Pietro Anangoni. The works of today's avant-garde are the poison fruit of a spiritual decadence with all the consequences that arise from a tragic loss of love for life. There is, going back to Plato, one of Plato's statements about art is that art essentially is a reflection of the soul of the artist. And Pietro Anangoni seems to also try to capture that. Here's some Picasso. Another direction that art can go this was the Maplethorpe exhibits in Cincinnati in the 1990s. It's just photography. This is Maplethorpe and Patti Smith for those uh, history of music lovers. Patti Smith was the lead singer of, I forget the name of the band now, in the, it was in the 80s band. And then of course, this is, this is absolute formalism. This guy made $5 million for this sculpture. last year. Don't you see the sculpture there? <laughs> it's a block of marble and there's a sculpture on top of it. This is absolute formalism. Yo sono, it's me, it's, it's me, <laughs> right? <laughs> and of course, I, I, someone say that's that, how could that be art, right? That's NFT, that's, that's, it's a non-fungible token, right? But it's, it's nothing. That which does not exist cannot be seen. It cannot give pleasure. It cannot be art. But that, but that's an, that would be the the excessive formalism. That would be, uh, well, also that's just a way of, 
art as absolute insider trading, right? <laughs> right? Just, it's whatever the rich is willing to pay for it at that point.